I'm Charles Rangely Wilson, and I'm a writer. I've been mad about fish and their underwater world for as long as I can remember. It's a passion that's taken me round the world into the heart of the wildest landscapes in the company of extraordinary people. From a famous lock in Scotland to a kingdom where time has stood still, I'm going to trace the strange journey of a very special fish to the roof of the world. So this is where my journey starts. This is Loch Leven in Scotland. The fish here were the Ferraris of the trout world. And the Victorians loved them so much, they took them all over Britain and all over the world. When these trout fetched up in the unspoilt Himalayan rivers of Bhutan, they thrived. It's been a dream of mine to travel to this fishing Shangri-La, but the journey has to start here at Loch Leven, the spiritual home of trout fishing. Ironically, this famous lock has suffered in recent times. Its delicate ecology upset by industry and agriculture. And nowadays, reared fish have to be used to maintain the fishery. <laughs> yeah, we've done it. Lock leaving brownie. That's the fish. It's taken all over the world. There are Victorians who are crazy about it. Now he's got his fizz back. I'm gonna let him go. I'm gonna follow him. All the way to the Himalayas. Right, off to the airport. In 1899, fish eggs of leave and trout were taken by Victorian colonialists, homesick for their fly fishing, to Kashmir. Packed in moss and cooled by ice, they survived the gruelling journey and were released into the lakes and rivers there. A few decades later, I don't know when or how exactly, they were taken from Kashmir to Bhutan. I'm hoping my search will shed light on what must have been an extraordinary journey. Amazing view out there. We've been flying for about half an hour from Calcutta over a completely flat blanket of clouds. But I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like surf. And it's rearing up against this shoreline of rocks, which is the Himalayas, just coming straight up through the clouds. Wonderful view. It's really exciting. Roof of the world. Oh, my God. We're now lower than the houses. This is the most spectacular land I've ever had. <laughs> OK, this is stunt type stuff. Look at that river. Sheltered in the middle of the Himalayas, Bhutan remains relatively untouched by the modern world beyond its borders. Flanked by Tibet and Nepal to the north and India to the south, this small country of less than one million people allowed no visitors before 1974, and since then, only a few. I get a real sense that I've stepped back in time. Well, I've come up to the government offices because you can't turn up in Bhutan and just go fishing. You actually need permission from the king, which I've got, so I've got to go in here to the Department of Tourism and collect my permit for the week. Hats off. In we go. 
I feel very privileged to be allowed to fish here. Uh, normally, yes, uh, as we are Buddhist uh, country, yeah. uh, fishing is uh, not a popular uh, sport here yet. Very, really grateful that uh, mm -hmm. you've allowed me to go fishing. Oh, look at that, laminated. So this is uh, your, your permit. Oh, brilliant, thank you very much. So. Well, that's great. Thank you. I hope I have a very good time. I'm sure I will. And you're very kind. I shall um, put this down my waders. Yes. Produce it on demand. Yes, yes. <laughs> you would need okay. it. It's quite something to have permission from a king to go fishing. And my royal permit lasts for one week. That Buddhism is central to Bhutanese culture is obvious. There are prayer flags, shrines and religious symbols everywhere. I arrived during a holy festival at the monastery in Paro, where my guide, Ugyun, has arranged to meet me. Well, I've made it. Here in Bhutan, and what a day. Unbelievable landscape. Well, I've got to find Ugin, my guide. We're here at a religious festival at the Zong at Paro, and he's inside, and there's a load of dancing and stuff going on, so I'm going to go and find him. Finding my way inside the temple is easy. I just follow the crowds and the music. Finding Ugyen might be a bit more difficult. Ugin. It took quite a while. Ugin, there's a hell of a lot of people here today. Yeah, it seems like it's fairly crowded today. What's the festival all about? Well, the, the festival here is uh, all about honoring the saint who brought Buddhism to Bhutan in the 8th century. Right. And beside that, it's also a social gathering. And that's how you can see everybody in their finest dress. There's, there's everyone from tiny little kids all the way through. Yes. Coming every, in very, very smart clothes. Yes. Everybody actually, you know, this is a very special location once in a year. Yeah. So they come in their fineries because so, they want to get blessing from all the mux dances that are presented here. So by viewing the dances, you actually receive a blessing? Yes, we receive blessing as well as we get more merits. And that's very important for Buddhists. Well, let's just enjoy it. A hopeful fisherman will take whatever blessings and merits he can get. All the dancers here are monks. All of these dancers are monks. And they all live here in this temple? Yes. Do they perform any kind of um, role in the community? It's a big thing. They is play a very spiritual role. Spiritual role. Right. And that is very important for Bhutan because uh, if it was not Buddhism, and if it was not the monastic body, Bhutan would have been not what we are right now. Okay. So it played a very important role. Okay. I've hardly started my journey, but already I'm taken with the atmosphere of the place. There's a serene calm everywhere. Bhutan's rivers divide the country into deep valleys, and the leaven trout are in most of them. But the two really special ones to me are the Gangti 
because it is the only spring-fed stream in the Himalayas and the torrential Tang Chu, Bhutan's most sacred river. Well, I spread the map out on the bonnet of my steed for the week, try and get a handle on where I'm going. Today we're going to drive to Timpu and then we're going to go over a pretty serious pass, uh, Do Chu La, it's apparently very, very high, to Punaka and then quickly on to the Gangti. So a couple of days there and then we're carrying on from Gangti over another pass to Tongsa and further and another pass and we're into Buntang, which is the furthest east the trout have been taken. But the Bumtang, the Tang Chu, the sacred river, is, is the really good trout river, they say. So, time to get going. Well, we're off, leaving Paro on Bhutan's principal highway, which is just wider than the truck. And we've got a journey that probably as the crow flies is not very far, but it's going to take us a hell of a while because these roads just have to follow the contours of the valley sides. Where we landed in Paro, it's about the only flat piece of Bhutan. Everything else is just on sheer hillsides. On the way to the capital, Timpu, I quiz Ogyan about how the trout came from Kashmir to Bhutan. He doesn't know much but suggests I meet with two government officials he's heard of, who may have more of an idea. While he picks up supplies, I track them down, and they kindly take a break from a business lunch to help me find some answers. So the brown trout, the, the Salmo truta, yeah. came into Bhutan in the early 1930s. Right. It was okay. brought all the way from Kashmir, in earthen pots. Uh, in uh, earthen pots. In earthen pots. pots. Were, the, were the trout brought as eggs in the pots or as little fish? As... They, were, they were brought in the form of fry, just as, hatched. Really? Just hatched. It's the, the governor himself who, who, who now is the great grandfather of the king. Oh, he I took see. a fancy in the, in the fly fishing and then he decided to bring them in the rivers of Bhutan and also uh, they visited some lakes where these fish are introduced. So the fish are in lakes as well, are they? Yeah. We have, uh, we have two lakes yeah. nearby at the altitude of 4,200 meters. That would be around 13,000 uh, or nearly 14,000 feet. That's so very high yeah, for trout, yes, isn't it? it? Is. And they're surviving there. Is it, are, they, are they miles away? Are they, uh, miles away yes. Are they really? <laughs> Four, five, uh, five, six days walk. I might run out of time for a six day trek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had no idea the trout had got as far as the glacial lakes in the high mountains and wish I'd allowed more time for my trip because a six day hike is out of the question. As it is, we must keep moving. It will take us a day just to get to the Gangti, the first river I plan to fish. It's really nice to get going. I've seen a hell of a lot in a short time. The festival, I've met all these guys back in Timpu, who've given me info on where to go and stuff about the country. It's really nice to get out on the road though and feel as though you're getting somewhere. Going to explore some of these rivers. It's an amazing country. We've been climbing now for about half an hour. And already I feel, you know, the climate has really changed because in Bhutan the climates are stacked one on top of the other. And you just go through subtropical to temperate just by going uphill, really. And, you know, my ears have popped. We've reached deciduous trees. There's rhododendrons. It's got distinctly cooler. It's crazy. We're climbing up to, I think the pass is about 12,000 feet. But Bhutan itself drops about 24,000 feet, I think, from up in the Himalayas down to the subtropics down the bottom. So you've got glaciers to tigers. Mad place. It's 
prayer flags on the hill. This is a special place. What, what, what's with all these prayer flags? Can you tell uh, me a bit about This is a very holy place. Up in the high passes, especially like this, we yeah. be very, I mean, our local deities and gods reside. And it's also a good place to, you know, host this uh, good luck prayer flags for every sentient being. If you look at uh, one of them, you can see the horse carrying the good luck jewel on the yeah. back. Yeah. And we use uh, wind as a medium to carry this uh, prayer to all the sentient beings. Oh, I see. So you hang them in windy places? Usually it has to be always on a windy spot. Oh, right, okay. As you can already feel the breeze. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Blown through. And there are lots of different colors. Do they have significance? Yes. The, usually you'll, you'll see here only like five major different colors. And each of uh, the five different colors represent the five elements. And the five elements are yellow for earth yeah. and we have green for the wood or yeah. tree and red for fire yeah. and uh, blue for water and white for air. Great spot. Stay here all day. Yes. <laughs> I even love to be here. You know? Yeah. Like you said, I can spend hours here reading. Yeah, you can just sit just here and chill out. Exactly. exactly. All day we drive past temples, prayer wheels driven by mountain streams, isolated villages and farmsteads. It's tempting to stop all the time, but we'd never get anywhere. So Ugin drives on while I gawp out the window. Road's roughed up for the last half an hour. Come up a huge pass, 3,000 meters, and we've only dropped down a little bit, so we're in the Gangti Valley. Pitch black, so I haven't seen the river yet. Well, I know down there somewhere is the river I've come halfway across the planet to fish. I know the river is out there somewhere, but I have to wait till dawn to see it. Meanwhile, the Bhutanese have a special way of sparking out after a long day on the road. <laughs> Hot stone bath. Oh, great Bhutanese tradition. All this salad is echinacea, and the bath is a cure all. For aching bones and tired feet, the Bhutanese have them when they've been trekking from village to village. Well, I haven't been trekking, I've been in a car for a day, but it still feels good. All that bubbling, by the way, it's the rocks. Not the lentil curry I had for lunch. Oh. The sun rises slowly in Bhutan, and I'm up before it's over the mountains, keen to find the river. This is a country within a country. Like I come over a mountain pass and step back 700 years. And the landscape's changed as well. It's much, much softer. 
I can see lots and lots of water, there's springs everywhere. I know that river's going to be really special. Anyway, I'm going to stroll down to the village here, make myself a nuisance, see if I can get a cup of tea and um, ask around, see if anyone can point me to the right bit of the stream. outside and this family very kindly invited me in and made me a great cup of tea. I think there's about eight spoons of sugar in there. It's going to fire me up for the day. Do you know uh, fish? Fish? Mm -hmm. You know the, what I mean by fish? Fish swim. Yes, sir. Yes? Okay, we've got fish. Uh, I've come to fish in your river. Oh, yes, that river there. Are there, are there fish? Yes, there are. Oh. Hello. Some fish. Uh, are the fish called trout? Trout. Yes? They are called trout. Excellent. Thank you very much. village it's just like a movie set it was so perfect I kept expecting Bilbo Baggins to nip out of one of the doorways slightly unreal I feel like I'm dreaming there's a there's a language a topography of rivers that you understand as a fisherman and that just screams awesome trout fishing. See what's in there. Aha, a fish rose right under that really dark bit. Tell you what, this river is full of trout. Oh, just spooked a couple of little ones. Ah, there we are. There's something rising just out over here. Oh, he came off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I tell you what, there's no shortage of fish in here. Let's see if I can get one to stick. No matter of where to fish here, every, every inch of this river is perfect. Absolutely perfect. This is what we've lost back home. This river was in England, would have straightened it and drained it, drained the fields taken all the gravel out and generally screwed it up. This is, this is a river as God built it. It's just heavenly. Hey. <laughs> Woo. It's my first trout from Bhutan, so who cares what size he is? Hello. Look at that. Brown trout from Scotland in the middle of the Himalayas. Okay. Back you go. Another little guy. <laughs> oh, he's tiny again. Come on, where's the big one? You know, I feel I've caught enough today. I've lost count of the trout. The river's just full of them. They're not the biggest fish in the world, but they are beautiful wild trout. 
And it's not just about the size, it's about the river. And this river is one of the most perfect I've ever seen. It's such a weird thought, isn't it, that this amazing spring-fed stream was flowing for so many thousands of years with no trout in it. They've only been in here 50 years. I suppose I'm leaving it hoping that they'll still be here in about 10,000 years time and the river will be just as unspoiled. I feel privileged to have spent just one day on such a perfect trout stream. For now, another long drive is ahead of us, another mountain pass. Bugin points the truck east and we travel miles of twisting roads. We're now halfway across Bhutan and we're at the easternmost point that they took the trout to. We're heading up now to find the Tang. Best trout stream in Bhutan. And there it is, the sacred Tang River. It's got a real Wild West feel, this sort of frontier town. All it's missing is the tumbleweed blowing down the middle of the street. <laughs> he nearly killed. Yeah, he's all right. Ugian wants to buy a prayer flag and the ingredients to make butter lamp candles so we can offer them to the river as a sign of respect. So when you say blocks, yes. it's like, oh, I see, it's, it's five panels all as one sheet, yeah? Yes. What's the drumming? It's a religious ceremony uh, going inside. OK. And uh, how many blocks do you want uh, from this colour? Maybe 17. 17 is uh, my birthday. Yeah, let's get 17. 17? Yeah, that looks like a good... 17? That looks like a good... Good length to blow in the wind. Hang on the Tang River, and that will be for a big fish. All right. OK. What about these candles we're supposed to float down the stream? Oh, I see we make them, do we? Yeah, we don't make it ourselves. Ah. And what do we float it on? We're going to use small cardboard uh, papers. We'll put this uh, lamp on top, we melt uh, the wax, and then we'll let it and let it flow on the river. You know how to make them, do you? I've been always making that, so no problem. <laughs> well, that was Janka, and we're heading up to find the tank. Got my prayer flag for a big fish, and bought stuff to make the butter candles, which we're going to light and float down the river. But on the way, I keep noticing certain things painted on the sides of the houses. Oh, look at those knobs. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Some great knobs on that house. <laughs> Some really graphically sort of pornographic ones. Eventually, my curiosity gets the better of me. I just have to ask. Again, you can't help noticing, driving around, all these phalluses painted on the walls of houses. What, what's that all about? Uh, in Bhutan, we have these uh, paintings on the doors and even uh, hanging on the forward direction of the house yeah. to get rid of the evil forces coming inside the house. How does this ward off evil? Well, uh, back in 15th century, the saint uh, who helped flourishing uh, Buddhism in Bhutan, mm -hmm. he was called the divine mad monk. Mm -hmm. And during his time, you know, there were many, many, many evil forces around, sure. demons around. And this was the tool that he actually used to subdue all the demons. Uh, so we actually call uh, the Wisdom Thunderbolt. Wisdom Thunderbolt? Yes. OK. And uh, so the Divine Madman used his Wisdom Thunderbolt to, to ward off evil. And that's why we have now you know, this big phalluses painted okay. all over Bhutan. As we're about to leave, I spot some kids fishing the stream behind the house. We go to find out how they're getting on, but they run off, thinking they're in trouble. They're running away. They 
At least we find out what bait they're using. Their crisp packet is full of worms. This one is for good luck for all the team. Good luck for the team. Off it goes. This one is for all sentient beings. And number three. This is for good fishing. Good fishing. Yeah. All right. Not a good sign. <laughs> we'll have an inauspicious lighter. Hold on. Okay, good fishing. Good fishing for Charles. Good fishing on the tang. Great. Love the way it's spinning. Lit. So it's still it's lit. Yeah. And ooh, loo, loo. So that was very good. That's very good. So I'm very definite that you're going to catch a big trout today. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. <laughs> I hang the prayer flag from a footbridge over the river, a windy spot. I like the idea of the prayers peeling off in the wind, upstream and into the mountains. There's some lovely big fish there. And there's probably some more up there. Oh yeah, I can see clearly. Yeah, that one there, yeah. Ugyan grew up on a farm here and goes off to see his family and friends. But he's fixed up a surprise for me. It might not be a Ducati, but it's great to feel the wind where my hair used to be. Ugyan has invited me to stay at his parents' house tonight and has mentioned how his dad is partial to a piece of fish now. I've seen the ideal place only I'm on the wrong side of the river. I know it will be worth it, if only I can get to it. I'll come and strike the rock three times in a minute. Whoa! The only way to appreciate how fast that water is is to go and stand in it. Quite nice, actually. You're going to ask me catch some fish for his folks because, to be honest, I put a lot of fish back. Back home, I fish rivers that I don't think can afford them. This river, absolutely pristine, definitely can, and it's nice to catch for the pot every now and again. These guys really do look, whoa, not unlike rock leaving fish. Whoa, they got a lot of fizz, these trout. Now that is a wonderful fish, look at that. 
Right, mister. First trout from the tang, you can go back. Off he goes. This is going to be fun. Tell you what, you think it's shallow, but it isn't. Whoa! Holy Moses. You are filming an angler in trouble. <laughs> oh, I could really do with a wading stick. This is like trying to walk over greasy cannonballs. But there's hundreds of trout in this pool. Oh, this one feels good. Oh, yeah, that's a good fish. That is a really nice fish. Oh, these guys are just awesome. Look at that. Well, I am staying with Jürgen's family this evening and I did promise to keep him some fish. And that is a supper fish if ever I've seen one. Whoa. These little taps I'm doing, it's not a nervous twitch. It's just to animate the fly a little bit. And it works. Hey. <laughs> That's a nice fish. Whoa. Woo. Come on. That is a fine brace of trout to put on the dinner table. Ogin and his mates seem intrigued by the fly fishing. but he has his own canny method to help stock the pot for supper. <laughs> this is the spot I've been after. A little bit of life. Twitch, twitch. Twitch, twitch. <laughs> Might as well have a sign on it that said Big Fish Lives Here. This is a weighty fish. Look at that, he's beautiful. I'm going to do well to get this guy in. He's really using the river. I'm going to start edging back to the bank now. I would really quite like to get this fish in. Whoa! Come on. That is just a beautiful fish. Let's keep him in the water. I can't keep him. He's too fantastic. Or she, rather. She's just too magnificent. You come and have a look from above. You'll see they're just perfectly built. Their environment, like a leopard, beautifully camouflaged. You can see the golden, coppery, brown and reds of this fish are exactly the same colours as the riverbed. She's also been attacked at some stage. You can see just here and here. I would walk to be to catch that fish. Right, she's definitely got her fizz back. She's going home. Say goodbye. Back you I won't see a better fish than that today, so very happy with my lot, I set off to Ugyun's parents' farmhouse for the night. The house here. This is your home. Yes, please. Where you grew up? This is where I grew up, yes. As we settle in, Ugin's father, the astrologer of the village, busy in prayer. Later, he joins us for his favorite fish supper, wild brown trout, wrapped in turnip leaves and deep fried with garlic and chili peppers. Usually we just uh, eat with our hands. 
No, for some reason, my dad even is using fork today. <laughs> <laughs> good idea. <laughs> the trout is tastes really good. He likes the trout, yeah? <laughs> exactly. What's your mum made for me? When we have a guest coming in, we offer the butter tea. I've heard of the butter tea. Yeah. This is a real delicacy, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. Good? Shish. 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 Okay. That's what they call it. Here we go. Mm, that is nice. Oh, Very is buttery. Yeah. You can really taste the butter. Bogun's dad knows these mountains well. <laughs> and while we chat, my thoughts turn back to those unreachable glacial lakes. I wonder if there are any I can get to in the time I have left. Um, but if your dad knows about lakes, is, uh, you, cause, uh, is there any chance of getting to one, do you think? Let me just ask him. So, Jing Oba and the Wall? The Wall and the Wall. So, he says, you know, of course we do have these big treks uh, mm. to get up to the lakes, which are like six, seven days to get up there. But he does know a lake that's just north of Timpu, which just takes two days to get up there. Two? Just two, yes. Really? So he's saying a lot of fish also. A lot of fish? There would be... Uh, okay, this is too good to miss. How high is this lake? Yes, that's quite high. And quite high here meaning approximately about 4,000 meters. 4,000 meters. It would be around 13,000 feet. Yeah, high. yeah, 13,000 feet. That's high. Quite high, yes. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been that high. Do you need <laughs> <Really>? oxygen? <laughs> I fished the gang tea, and I, 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 the gang tea was wonderful, and I've seen that, and I've come here, and I can't do better than that fish I had today. Right, right. And uh, I would really like to get to one of these lakes because I've been thinking about them all week, and, and I. I'm not sure that there are brown trout any higher than that. These, these are way, way up. And right. all the other places I know of brown trout, the Atlas Mountains and the Alps and this sort of thing, I'm not sure they're as high as the Himalayas. So, really? okay, that sounds great. Yeah, well, you must thank your dad for the tip. <laughs> I can't quite believe that I'm going to get the chance to fish for trout on top of the world. Ugin called ahead to fix up some horses and tents, but the scale of the operation takes me by surprise. Ugin hands over to Kinzang, a guide who specializes in trekking at altitude. He focuses my mind on the task ahead. So today we are going to start our trek. So normally, we always advise the clients to be prepared before we start the trek. Sometimes, like when we go higher and higher up on our passes, like the people get sick, they get headache, nauseous, and then like vomiting, sort of. Then we have to always come, try to come back, come down, because we don't want to risk their life on the mountain. Well, this kit's rather brought home to me that this is a a serious trek, you know, I was, so, I was so into the idea of like, let's go hiking up the Himalayas and catch a trout. I hadn't really quite focused on how high it is. And, uh, and now we've got altitude sickness as a possibility and all the rest of it. So I don't know, I've never been that high before and um, it's a hell of a way. I really want to make it up there though. I hope I don't come a cropper with a headache and all the vomiting and all the rest of it Kunzeng was on about. We shall see. It will take two days to reach the lake that is as high as the Everest base camp. Tonight we will pitch our tents by a monastery that is on the route. All I have to do now is get there. Kunzeng. How did the trout get so high? Well, these trouts are planted in the lake because the criminal, the stealers, you know, and then 
they are sent up to the lake and planted and or in another, another way is to stay in a jail. Okay, so, so it's people, a choice, jail yes, or yes. take a fish up a mountain? Yes, so if they take the fish up on the mountain, they plant the fish in the lake and then they are free to go out. It's amazing to think that the fish were carried up here by petty criminals who were given the choice. Two months in prison or strap this pot full of water and fish to your back and get up that mountain. Right now, a holiday at His Majesty's pleasure seems quite appealing. long to recover but it's like it's like swimming the whole length of a pool underwater coming up the far end like that but it's like that once you've gone 15 paces uphill you're really grabbing at the air for some oxygen it's so thin amazing place though. we're so high up I feel like looking over there I'm on a level with the mountains opposite While I get my breath back, Kinzang whittles me a Bhutanese good luck charm. To ward off evil, obviously. Thank you. <coughs> that is a fine magic thunderbolt. That'll keep me safe in the hills, eh? Yeah. Now you'll have a safe journey with yeah. trekking. Excellent. So no evil spirit can Kunzang. create any problem. Kunzang, mine is bigger than yours. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're taller than me. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the monastery's getting closer. Yeah, yeah. Now it's just a piece of cake. Pe <laughs> my Are these uh, wrestlers here? Are they young monks? Yeah, these monks, the small monks, they are just They're on the monastery side, they are studying. Practicing peace and kindness to each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is their playtime. Yeah, they look like they're having a laugh. <laughs> small smoke oh, coming okay. out. So sometimes when you see from the viewpoint, it's all hazy, you know? Yeah, so it's clearer in the morning. Yeah, in the and morning. And windy in the afternoon. Yeah. This is amazing. How long has this been here? Well, it's been built a long time ago, around date back to the 13th century. <coughs> the guys, live, these monks live here all, uh, all winter long? Yeah, they live all the time. They must be tough. So once a um, week they go down to get, to food. get the food, yes. <sighs> Are we allowed in? Yeah. You have to put off the cap? Yeah, OK. This is a typical cloister where the monks cook, eat and sleep. Dotsring is the head of the monastery. Could you ask Dotsring? Uh, he's kindly invited us in. I'm really interested to find out about their day, their daily routine. Do they get up very early? Okay. <laughs> They get up five o'clock in the morning. They do the prayer in the morning. After breakfast, then they go and play or the training of drums and then training of flute. So everybody has to go to sleep. 
Okay. Nine, nine, nine o'clock. When we came up the hill uh, and we saw those little boys, they're obviously very, very small, but they're already training to be monks. Mm -hmm. how, how early do they start? Okay. So uh, the youngest, the smallest they have is 10. Right. And then the teacher is saying they are just small in the size. Oh, really? But their age is going to 10, 11. When the sun sets, the temperature drops from plain cold to brass monkey freezing. I haven't been to bed so early since I was about five years old. It's eight o'clock. It's absolutely freezing outside. The temperature dropped like a stone. It started snowing a few minutes ago. So I'm lying in my tent now with two pairs of thermal socks, two pairs of thermal trousers, a thermal vest, about eight t-shirts and a sweater and a hot water bottle next to my back and I've just about sorted myself out. I had no idea chasing this trout up a mountain would be quite so mad. Anyway, I've got a seriously good night ahead of me so I'll be set up for tomorrow I'm sure. I slept badly and was short of breath all night, but my permit expires today and I'm still six hours away from the lake. Look at that mountain. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, you see? You go just behind that, that one. Then down to the lake. Which one? You see first ridge? Yeah. The second ridge? Yeah. That's on the bottom is the lake. Yeah, campus. Hush. Oh, it does look beautiful. Worth the walk. Worth the pain. Now we've just got to try and catch yeah. one of the highest brown trout in the world. Yeah. But this year, I think uh, the people, they are not lucky, especially the farmers. It's been a hard winter. Yeah. We had uh, no snowfall, so the people around in the farm, they have really difficult. This has to be as remote and bewitching a place as I've ever cast a fly. Bit of a forest up here. We've certainly had to work hard to earn the thrill of fishing here. Oh, 
that look like a nice fish? Ah, uh, not far enough. <laughs> I'm just, there's a few fish moving out here, which I'm really, really pleased by. I've put on a team of three flies, exactly what I'd use if I was fishing leaving today. And if my knowledge of mountain locks is anything to go by, the fish in here will be hungry enough that they'll grab anything that looks like a meal. What a place. The whole of that shore is covered in snow under rhododendrons. And there's an amazing beard of icicles up on the hill there. I think we just must be about as high as you can fish for brown trout anywhere on the planet. And let's see if we can catch one. He took the very top fly. I'm just going to bring it in here. A bit of a long and lean example of Loch Leven brown trout. It's a very, very satisfying feeling to catch that little fella on top of the world. You couldn't change a thing on that without spoiling it. Okay, ready, off you go. There. <sighs> that is so satisfying. And all this weight, fish came on a longer journey though. Loch Leven on a steamer, and then 30 or 40 years in Kashmir, and then a pit pony and some clay pots over to Bhutan, and then gloriously, <laughs> insanely brought to the top of a mountain by some poor bloke who stole a loaf of bread. Shangri-La's somewhere in the Himalayas. I suppose I came here looking for my own fly fishing Shangri-La. I've been thinking to myself this afternoon, is it the Gangti or the Tang or this lake? In the end, I think it's the country. I've loved every minute of this trip. It's been much more than a fly fishing trip, really. It's been a sort of retreat in a way. It won't be the last time I come either. You know, fly fishing in the most unspoilt place on earth. And the fish are still going. I'm just moved there. I'm gonna fish into the dark, no matter how cold it gets. Charles is going to be heading off in search of the legendary peacock bass in the Amazonian rainforest.